All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, we're glad that you're joining us today. We really appreciate that you're uh, making time to join us for this information uh, session today. Uh, this information session for the CRFs, Canadian Race Relations Foundations, um, National Anti-Racism Fund, otherwise known as NARF. Uh, we're really looking forward to spending the next hour or so with you, really to review the objectives and eligibility of our NARF Projects funding program. Uh, my name is Shannon Ryan. Uh, I'm the Director of Community Investment here at the CRF. And uh, before we start, a couple of things that I'd like to flag for you, if it's okay. Um, we want you to know that today's session is going to be recorded and is being recorded. Uh, really, that's in the interest of sharing it with those that aren't able to attend today, and really for you to go back if you need to, uh, to listen to something again. Uh, this session will also be delivered in English. Um, tomorrow's session will be delivered in French. If you need information or, or have questions about that, please feel to let us know in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, today, before we start, I'd really like to inform you as well that I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues, uh, Sharon, Ibrahima, and Rosalind, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves before we get started. So Sharon, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sharon. I'm one of the Partnerships Managers here at the CRF, and happy to meet you today. Thanks, Thank Sharon. Ibrahima? Hi, everyone. My name is Ibrahima Gay, and I'm the Partnership I'm Another partnership manager here at CRF. Welcome, and uh, we'll be here supporting you. Thanks. Thanks, Ibrahima and Rosalind. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosalind Kang. I'm the Western Regional Coordinator uh, for the CRF. I'm based out of Treaty 7 region in Calgary, Alberta. Thanks, Rosalind, and thanks, uh, teammates. Uh, but before we get started today, I would also, uh, of course, like to start with a land acknowledgement, which is a very much the practice of the CRF. And of course, I would like to, you know, first acknowledge that the land that I'm speaking to you from is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, and these lands, as we all know, are home to many uh, diverse First Nation Inuit and Métis people. I also acknowledge that uh, Toronto, where I live, and where the Toronto offices of the CRF are located are covered by Treaty 13 uh, with the Mississaugas of the Credit and also the Williams Treaty uh, signed with the Mississaugas and uh, Chippewa bands as well. Uh, as we know, uh, today the lands that we share are home to many diverse and distinct First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. And of course, we acknowledge them as the, tr the traditional caretakers of these lands and acknowledge the many, many distinct, distinct groups of First Nation peoples, uh, each with their own language and custom and territories that live on this land. Uh, from the Hashquiat on the west coast to the Bayotuk on the east, the Hatladeche in the north, the Algonquin, the Anishinaabe, the Anishkandiga, the Potawatomi, the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and their many nations, and so many others that have called these lands home for tens of thousands of years. At the CRF, we of course respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous people. And we're ultimately committed to working alongside Indigenous nations and in Indigenous people and Indigenous communities to combat racism, to combat anti-Indigenous racism, and to mobilize action on what is a very long uh, path towards both truth-telling and towards active reconciliation. We also, of course, want to acknowledge the, both the Indigenous caretakers of these lands, but also acknowledge the Indigenous elders and knowledge carriers and Indigenous leaders who are perhaps on this call today, um, but the ones that we work with at the CRF as well. And they are vital to our success as an organization. And we're very grateful to be walking this journey with them uh, and to be living and working on these lands. So with that said, uh, I have the real pleasure, as always, of introducing our executive director, Mohammed Hashim, who will uh, share a few opening words uh, and uh, welcome you all to the meeting. So, Mohammed, Mohammed, over to you. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you for starting us off in the right way. I, you know, before I begin, I just wanted to, um, I, I wanted to just acknowledge that obviously there's uh, there are things that are happening in this world that are creating tremendous pain for many. Uh, within Canada, there are Palestinians, there are Muslims, there are Jewish neighbors who are going through severe pain and difficulty, both by what they're seeing over there, but also 
by the rise of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Palestinian racism. And we want to make sure that, you know, we are not just um, in support of all these communities, but we want to make sure that this is something that we are working towards and uh, are committed to address as well. Um, it's a difficult time for, for many, many people. I know there's a lot of pain out there, so I just wanted to I would start by that by acknowledging that that exists and that uh, recognizing that to be true. Uh, the CRF, uh, what through their National Anti-Racism Fund, uh, invests uh, millions of dollars into communities. This is our largest investment. And we know that the conversations that these uh, projects will evoke will change the way we not only see uh, the relationships that we have amongst each other, but uh, to the policies that are created, to the to the laws that are created, and to actual change. Um, you know, I'm really sick and tired of thoughts and prayers. I want to see policy change. Uh, and I think many of us who are working and have worked in this environment for a long time want to see more of that. So our, our focus on this round of grants is for those organizations to, to who want to see things move, who want to see, um, you know, like laws and policies move forward uh, in a way that is constructive. And we really appreciate everybody who's attended here who wants to see how they can contribute to this vaster conversation and this commitment. Uh, but we also want to see how this conversation inspires people. You know, I've been across this country and I've met recipients of our of our grants, um, and I can see how some of them have uh, used uh, the support that we've been able to provide in ways that have created intense amount of uh, leadership um, and uh, inspiration where um, they're doing real work to be able to build um, new relationships. And I'll give you an example. There's in Winnipeg, we, we uh, help support the Spirit of Reconciliation, which was uh, an organization that brought together um, residential school survivors, as well as uh, Catholic church members. And they sat through, you know, four or five days each on their own first and then together to hear and understand how they see each other. They see themselves towards themselves. They see each other. And then how do they both, when they come back to each other, see each other in a new way? Uh, and it's having tremendous impact in terms of how they are now having cultivating a different conversation. Um, we've seen youth groups who are inspiring youth by the dozens and sometimes hundreds to be able to do uh, and lift new um, new voices and new opportunities and to have them imagine themselves in different ways in different places. So we're, we're hoping for all of that um, out of this round as well. And um, and we just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, it's an extremely competitive grant, and I know that you know that's going to create disappointment. But it's not that uh, we don't think that like what you're doing is not um, what we're hoping to to uh, to support. It is all of the work that you're doing is something that we're hoping to support. But we're also limited by just the way I, the the pockets that we had last time. We had about six hundred applications worth over sixty million dollars to uh, in applications, and we were able to disperse around two and a half to three. So it's a super competitive environment, but it's it's something that I always want to make sure that you know, you know that we deeply value all of the work that you're doing across this country. Uh, and before and before we jump into the um, the details of what the grant will be. I just wanted to welcome our Minister Kamal Kara, who is the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion, and Persons with Disabilities, to share a few words. Well, hello, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. First and foremost, I want to thank the Canadian Race Relations Foundation for inviting me to participate in today's information session. Since 1997, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation has been on a mission to advance public policy on anti-racism through partnership, engagement, promoting awareness, and of course, mobilization. 
One of the main ways they've been doing this is through programs like the National Anti-Racism Fund, which aims to support organizations that combat racism, foster dialogue, and build a more inclusive and an anti-racist society. Launched in 2022, the National Anti-Racism Fund has helped build a national framework for the fight against racism in Canadian society. It supports hundreds of racialized communities, religious minority groups, and Indigenous peoples as they carry out their own work to combat racism and create opportunities for meaningful dialogue with the broader public. Over the past two years, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation has distributed over $4.6 million to enable the powerful work of over 230 organizations. Over the next year, the National Anti-Racism Fund Project Stream will provide approximately $4 million in grant funding for projects right across Canada. So if you're planning an innovative project to take place between March 2024 and March 2025, you should apply. Their projects portal will open until 11.59 p.m. on January 8th, 2024. I want to take a moment to thank everyone at the Canadian Race Relations Foundation for their leadership in designing and implementing this program. And thank you to all those that are going to be applying for this work. Together, we are building a more inclusive, resilient Canada. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Oh, they put the thing on there too. Thank you, Minister Kara, for the remarks. Um, I wanted to also just make sure we thank uh, our um, Director of Community Investment, Shannon, uh, Sharon, and Ibrahima, who are uh, partners, uh, partnership managers, Abiola, who also works in the department, um, and all our regional staff from Rosalind, Kevin, Zara, uh, and the program staff, Uswa, um, and uh, Nargis, and Ohana and Saveka for all the excellent work that they've done working with you. And uh, I'll kick it over back to, to Shannon. Thanks so much, Mohammed, And thank you too for opening us in a good way. And thank you for your excellent work as well and your leadership. We really appreciate you a lot. And again, thanks for joining us. So uh, folks, we have about an hour together today to get through a fair amount of information. I can see that there are questions already come into the chat, which is great, into the Q&A, I should say. Um, and we'll get to as many of those as we can today. But really, today's session is for prospective NARF grantees. Really, we want to review um, with you our program guidelines and objectives, really in the interest of supporting you to learn more about the requirements of NARF projects funding, right? We really want to ultimately deepen our understanding of our funding requirements uh, to support the submission of strong applications uh, that meet our funding criteria. We'll be covering a lot today, including the purpose of NARF, which Mohammed has already spoken to a little bit, as has the minister, um, some of our themes and objectives and expected results. We'll talk about funding details and eligibility, our application processes, and really the types of support that our, our team can offer you um, moving forward. And then after we've gotten through a presentation, which will take about 30 minutes, we'll, we'll move on to a Q&A session. Um, we'll, of course, ask you, given that we've got about 300, I think about 300 people on this call right now, we'll be asking folks to submit questions in the Q&A box. Um, the box is found at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be sorting through these questions throughout the session. We'll get to as many of them as we can in our last 30 minutes together. But again, given that there are several hundred of, uh, several hundred of us here today, um, we might not get to everything. Some questions we'll answer live, and many uh, we will answer in the Q&A box. Um, please note as well, uh, that we will really prioritize questions uh, regarding the application process, uh, relating to our funding criteria, and that we might not, we, I don't think we will get to all questions today, given the number of folks that are on the call today. Um, if your questions about NARF aren't answered in today's session, uh, please feel free to send us a question. It's the grants at CRF inbox email. I think you all have it. It's on our website. We can put it, uh, we, you can see it on our, on our materials. Um, so please submit questions following today's session if you need to. I do, however, want to note that our offices are closed between November 22nd and January 22nd. Sorry, just January 2nd, I should say. Uh, and we will get do our best to get to your questions uh, before the holiday break. 
And of course, we will prioritize responses to questions upon our return on January 2nd. We will also send today's deck to you. So you will have the slides and the, public, the recording will be made publicly available very shortly after this meeting. Really, we want to make sure that anyone who's not on the call today um, can view this video, can view this recording. And also, if you need to come back to it, um, we want to make sure that it's available to you. Like Mohammed, I, I really feel it's essential that we start this meeting with a lot of thanks. Uh, I think thanks to all of you for attending, but I'll, I specifically want to call, call out um, my amazing colleagues at the CRF, um, Sharon and Ibrahima, Abiola and Viola from the community investment team, and our amazing colleagues uh, from both the programs team and the communications team. We really appreciate their support. And... Um, Collectively, we're all looking forward to telling you a little bit more about NARF today. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. So we really want to talk a little bit about the purpose of NARF, uh, about the CRF first, I should say. And really, we're here as an organization to ultimately, you know, strengthen the social fabric of Canadian society. We want to create conversations about it, race, racism and anti-racism. We want to enable communities and convene communities, including groups and organizations, to, to do the work uh, through our grants and services and our network of public and research and community partners. We are really here to support organizations and communities to really center conversation and dialogue about the realities of racism, racialization, et cetera, in Canada. Uh, for those of you who don't know us well, we're a Crown Corporation. Really, we're ultimately committed to supporting um, organizations like yours, uh, community and grassroots organizations across the country who really have a mission to root out racism and discrimination through outreach and education programming and services, programming that you all deliver. We also, of course, work in the policy realm and are very interested in advancing policy that results in some of the changes that Mohammed spoke to earlier in terms of systemic barriers uh, that um, racialized and religious minority Canadians experience. Uh, we were created uh, by the government of Canada uh, back in 1996 as a crown corporation as part of the, the Japanese Canadian redress agreement that really affirmed, and it's our job really to affirm uh, the principles of justice and equality for all in Canada. And one of the ways that the CRF does this work, and Mohammed spoke to this as well, is um, through our National Anti-Racism Fund, which really supports our commitment to building a national framework to fight racism in Canadian society, really ultimately by strengthening the capacity of our communities uh, to do this work. Um, and these communities include organizations like yours, uh, religious minority communities, and of course, Indigenous communities across the country, really in the interest of actively combating racism and creating hopefully opportunities for meaningful dialogue and learning and sharing with the broader public. Next slide, please. So um, I guess a, a couple of things I would say uh, about the NARF program. Um, one moment, apologies. One thing I should say before I jump into kind of the objectives of the program is that, uh, as Mohammed said earlier, uh, we uh, offer a significant amount of funding through NARF over the past couple of years. You know, we've supported about 230 organizations, again, organizations like yours, um, to do this work, um, contributing essentially four and a half million dollars um, through this fund. Uh, we will do this again uh, in the coming years. So this year, uh, in fiscal year 23-24, uh, by March 31st, we will have uh, contributed an additional $3 million in NARF funding, $1 million for pro events and youth, uh, which is also open for applications right now, and $2 million for projects funding, which is what we're talking about today. We're going to do the exact same thing next year. So next year, early in the fiscal, we will be announcing, again, opportunities for funding, at the same levels, uh, $2 million for projects and an additional $1 million for events and youth initiatives. So please watch out for news about those. I will say, uh, and Mohammed referenced this at the beginning, that the demand for NARF project funding is actually quite significant, very substantial. Over the past couple of years, we've received about $60 million in funding requests and have uh, um, allocated or invested about $3 million in projects. So this tells us and tells you that, again, demand is very high and that 
we're only able, unfortunately, to fund only a fraction of the applications that we receive. So we ask that you keep that in mind uh, as you're uh, thinking about engaging with this project. In terms of what NARF is trying to do, um, we're seeking applications from you that really kind of ultimately align and or um, meet one of uh, our key themes and objectives. Uh, these are in no order, by the way. Uh, none of these have priority over the other. You can work to one or all of them if you'd like in your project application. And really, um, there are four objectives that we're trying to accomplish through NARF. And these are real objectives and, and uh, essential and important themes given the world that we all work in these days. Really, first, we want NARF to really start to, to work to address uh, the systemic and structural barriers that racialize Canadians experience. Really, we want to see projects that we that, that support the reduction of barriers to inclusion. And how do we do this? We wanna see projects that address systemic racism in a range of institutional spaces, including the education system, the healthcare system, the justice system, public services, employment, public life, and beyond. We want to root out racism where it lives. And uh, we all know that racism exists in many of the systems that we all engage in. We also wanna invest in research and education. Really, we want to um, ensure that as a community of, of folks working to address racism in Canada, that we have access and availability to data and evidence that tells us the story of racism, racialization uh, in Canada, really in the interest, again, of uh, reducing and, uh, and, and eliminating some of those structure or bar structural barriers that I've talked about. Really, through research and education, we're looking to gather community insight uh, on race relations in Canada. We're looking for folks who are most implicated in this work to tell the story uh, on behalf of their communities. We also wanna increase public awareness and really uh, ensuring that um, uh, conversations about race, racism and racialization are top of mind for many Canadians. I think for a lot of Canadians, uh, it is not top of mind. So we want to increase public awareness. Um, uh, and of course we wanna increase awareness, but to what, to what objective? We want that awareness ultimately to inform the framing and reframing of public policy, um, really again, through highlighting some of the institutional and systemic barriers that many Canadians experience. And then finally, we want to create cross-cultural opportunities for a discussion and dialogue between racialized communities and among racialized communities, really ultimately building awareness through these collaborations. We want to center uh, a spaces for communities to come together uh, to have some of these challenging conversations and to determine and develop um, responses and solutions on their own terms, in their own words. So next slide, please. We're also looking for applications to achieve some of these expected results. Um, and again, like with the themes and objective slide, we're asking you to at least do one of them, or it could be more. Um, uh, in terms of achieving these results. And these are, again, in no particular order, but they include, again, we want to make sure that our projects are in increasing public awareness, really highlighting issues related to policy, especially in relation to some of these race relations, anti-racism, anti-hate, uh, nationally, locally, or regionally. Um, we also want to increase a public awareness and, and knowledge of Canada's uh, always changing cultural diversity, ensuring that um, Everyone who lives on these lands has a has a, a an understanding of um, who exactly lives on these lands and the diversity of those communities that live on these lands. And then we also want to increase awareness of factors such as race, culture, ethnicity, and religion, the realities and kind of identities that often hinder full participation in Canadian for the entire Canadian population. And again, this is in a in a, a range of spheres and realms, including broader society the economy, and in a range of institutions. And finally, we all also want to increase the knowledge and capacities of communities to address racism and discrimination. And I think we'll hear a lot about those projects as we, as we uh, review our applications in the coming weeks and months. So those are our objectives and themes and, and priorities. With that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Sharon, to talk a little bit more about um, some of the processes regarding applications, timing, and that kind of thing. So, Sharon, over to you. Thanks, Shannon. Next slide, please. Yeah. This particular stream is for projects, and we'll first begin by going through the funding details. 
On the funding amount, this stream has a total of $2 million available for funding. The funding available for any proposed project can range from a minimum of $25,000 to a maximum of $125,000. Applicants may only submit one application per organization. Um, this time around, the flow of funds will be a 40-40-20 split, where 40% of funds will be released upon contract signing, 40% upon submission of a brief interim report, and 20% of funds after submission of a final report. Both interim and final reports are to be completed on the Survey Monkey Apply platform. Applications for initiatives currently receiving funding through either the CS Mari program or the ARAP program administered by the Department of Canadian Heritage will only be considered if the application is to extend or expand an existing initiative. Next slide, please. Next is on eligibility. So NARC Projects funding is open to Canadian regist registered charities as recognized by the CRA and Canadian nonprofit organizations and associations First Nations, Inuit, and Métis organizations, Canadian non-federal public institutions such as municipalities, board of boards of education, schools, colleges, and universities, and labor organizations. On the other hand, CRF will not fund for-profit organizations, federal institutions, individuals, and or organizations whose purpose is solely related to political activity as defined by the CRA. Next slide, please. The following is an overview of eligible expenses, which are personnel and staffing costs related to programming, project costs such as speaker honoraria, venue expenses, equipment, marketing, communications, workshop, and meeting costs, purchase services such as services of consultants, contractors, or subject matter experts, specifically related to project delivery, evaluation costs such as project evaluation, survey administration, focus groups, and evaluation reporting, and finally, overhead administrative costs directly associated with the project can be requested to a maximum of 15% of the total budget. The following is an overview of ineligible expenses, which are costs related to direct financial assistance in form of payments to individuals or families, partisan political activity, ongoing occupancy costs, services covered by provincial health authorities, services provided by medical professionals or regulated health professionals, other than social workers or social service workers, purchase of investment in real property, cost of alcoholic beverages, and basic shelter beds or transitional housing beds. So on the application process, um, this process is pretty straightforward and the link to the online portal can be found in our guidelines on the CRF website. The steps in applying are to number one, go to the application portal, create or use an existing profile to fill in an online form, Number two, attach all the required supporting documents, including the budget table, the template of which is available for download on our website in the guidelines, most recent annual financial statements, which we request to be, the, to be the most recent two years. And if your organization's annual revenue are more than $250,000, then these will need to be audited. As well, we require your organization's latest annual report and a list of board members. You may also include letters of support, but these are optional. And lastly, submit your application through the online server monkey portal and emailed submissions will not be accepted. Um, again, applications will only be accepted through the portal. A PDF file of the application questions is available for download on the website. And we encourage you to download this file to review questions and prepare all information and attachments before submitting your application. The portal will be open until 11.59 p.m. ET on January 8th. 2024. Um, applications must include a detailed schedule with a completion date no later than March 31st, 2025, with a final report to be submitted by May 31st, 2025. Um, an important thing to note here is that based on our experience with the previous project stream, some issues have come up regarding account recovery because the individual submitting the application is no longer with the organization um, resulting in the organization not being able to access the reporting forms at project end. So because both interim and final reports will be submitted through the SurveyMonkey platform with the same login information as the initial application, we encourage whoever, was, whoever is applying to share this login with a colleague or project team in case of turnover or the unforeseeable future. And um, decisions will be made, oh, sorry. 
previous slide, please. Yeah. Decisions will be made eight to 10 weeks after the submission deadline by CRF's board grants subcommittee um, and supported by the CRF staff granting team. And all decisions are final and there is no appeal process through the funding program. Next slide, please. The following criteria will be used to evaluate all eligible applications. These are alignment with program themes and objectives, achievement of one or more of the expected results, which were in the previous slide, um, demonstration of the experience, human and financial resources, governance structure, and capacity to successfully carry out the project based on past experience, demonstration of need within their community and how it will be addressed, um, having the required resources to successfully deliver the project on time and on budget, project activities are clearly described and linked to goals, project is designed to effectively reach its target audience, beneficiaries, and participants, proposed budget is detailed, reasonable, balanced, and takes into consideration the efficient and effective use of funds, and must indicate if the project can continue even, after, even if CF is only able to allocate partial funding. So on this point, there is a question in the application form that will ask if your proposed project is open to partial funding, and you can indicate this there. And lastly, the applicant agrees to fulfill the CRF recognition requirements. Um, we also want to quickly note here that we receive way more applications, um, as Shannon and Mohammed have alluded to, than the funds that we give out. And again, to illustrate our previous project streams, maximum available funding was 3.1 million, but received 59 million in funding requests. Um, and this is to say that NAR funding is, again, highly competitive. Um, and based on the number of applications we receive this round, we will only be able to fund a fraction of them. But we also want to remind you that there will be new opportunities for NAR projects funding announced in the new year, and we'll fund projects at a similar level. Next, on the evaluation process, or no, a recognition requirements. All successful applicants must acknowledge the financial support received from the CRF through NARF in all communications, materials, and promotional activities. Um, the next slide, it was, yeah, thank you. Um, so following the CRF branding guide, the public acknowledgement of text should state the following, which is the title of your project was made possible through the financial support of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation's National and Jurisdiction Fund. And in addition to this, applicants will also be asked to provide a recognition plan in the application form. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I would now like to take some time to introduce CRF's regional coordinators and program manager on the screen here. Some of them are also in the room with us today. So from left to right, Najez is our programs manager based in Quebec. Kevin is our regional coordinator for Atlantic Canada. Rosalind is our regional coordinator for Western Canada, who you met earlier. And Zara is our regional coordinator for British Columbia, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. So regional coordinators also share oversight of projects in Ontario. And these wonderful individuals will be in charge of monitoring successful applicants for the region. Next slide, please. For general questions and important links, we have our grants email linked to our guidelines as well as our FAQ, which is also in the guidelines webpage. And now we'll move on to the Q&A portion of the session. And again, we would like to note that we will prioritize questions regarding the application process, grant criteria, um, and that we may not get to all questions today, but that you can feel free to just submit any questions to our grants email inbox. Um, please know we also do not offer feedback on specific projects and activities. So I'll now pass the time to Rosalind. Rosalind, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Um, one of the questions I have here is where can we access the slide deck presentation after the information session? So the slide deck will be sent to all registrants and attendees of today's session after this. Okay. It's over. Um, how many grants will be given out in total? So as so, stated before, the what? total available amount of funding for this stream is $2 million. 
Um, and any application can request a minimum of 25,000 up to 125,000 in funding request. Thank you. Um, can organizations partner in the application? There will need to be a lead applicant, um, but you can list them as a collaborating partner. There is a question for that in the application form. Great, thanks. Are the grants focused on different regions of Canada? Jane, do you want to speak more to this? Sure. So we're, we're interested, obviously, in funding uh, projects in every province and territory. Um, so absolutely, we're looking to um, receive project applications from each of those. Um, I wouldn't say that we necessarily prioritize one region over the other. However, we are absolutely interested in ensuring that we are funding equitably and that this fund touches every province and territory uh, and as many communities as possible. So we will consider that will be a consideration uh, in our review process, uh, really in the interest of ensuring again geographic geographic equity. Thanks. Hey, um, can I can I can I add something? I was just going to jump to that question just to clarify people that your project also we operate in a national at a national level here, so your project can also have impact in different mm -hmm. area. So you can be focused. Your project can be. Uh, of course, Ontario, based in Ontario, but if you think that your reach can be to Quebec or uh, uh, other provinces, feel free to list those areas as well, because it, we operate in a national scope. I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Ibrahima. Um, is the fund for only nonprofit organizations or can for-profit organizations apply? Yeah, we are not accepting applications from for-profit organizations. This is a, a, a funding specifically for charitable organizations and other institutions as described in our eligibility requirements. Um, can the funding be used to expand a pilot project funded initially through a provincial grant? I think I touched on this a bit earlier, but projects that do receive funding from CSMR or ARAP programming on some Canadian heritage, and they can apply if it's to extend an existing initiative. Okay. Um, do I have to have funding from other sources before my application can go through? Right. Can I do no. this one? Oh, no, sure. you don't. Yes. So, no, you don't have to have funding uh, or the funding. We, you don't have to list it. But as Sharon mentioned that if you're open to selecting partial funding, we expect you to have the resources, those extra resources to be able to implement the project from start to finish, including the funding with the amount of funding we're going to give you. And also you have also the liberty to say, no, I'm not open to partial funding. Or also, whenever you are, whenever we you before signing the uh, agreement, the grant agreement, if you realize you won't be able to complete this project with the money we give you, we are open to talking to you in revising the deliverable. And if you can't, you think that your organization doesn't have the capacity to deliver the project with the amount of funding, you're welcome to also decline to withdraw in it. So we are, we it's going to be case by case. But it's always good to secure fundings if you're open to partial funding. Okay. Um, if an organization is newly established, like more than a year ago, and doesn't have an annual report yet, do um, can we apply? Yes, you you can apply. I mean, it is a competitive process, uh, and uh, an organization. Uh, what financial statesman does for you is help us assess your financial capacity in, and delivering and delivering delivering and managing the funding. So it will help us. Of course, it's gonna going to be a little bit of your disadvantage because we it is a competitive process. But you're welcome to apply and uh, will uh, again we assess application 
on a case to case basis since we're not going to compare application and depending on the scoring you might not score well at the financial level but you might score very well when it comes to community need or your project activity and that's put you on top of somebody who has you know financial statesman but did not really score well in the community need section mm -hmm. so of course you can apply yeah, I would I would just add that I, part of our kind of analysis of, around equity, like we've talked a little bit about geographic equity, but I think one of our frameworks for equity also includes large and small organizations, established and emerging organizations as, as all playing really an essential role in this program area. And so um, uh, I would say that that should not limit you in any way. Uh, again, as Ibrahim has said, if you've got a pr great project idea, uh, we want to hear about it. And if it is especially aligned with our objectives um, and everything else seems to be fine, I, we would absolutely be considering you for a project. Thank you. Um, does an organization or group get feedback after their application? So we do uh, We do really give feedback, but mostly by email. So because as you know, it is, we got a lot going on when we supporting over right now, as you can see, there is 300 organization on this call and everybody wants to support. We would love to support everybody, provide one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. But if you need feedback, of course, you can email us using the grant email box and your application ID, and they will be happy to give you feedback. Thank you. Uh, there's a been a couple of questions about the evaluation plan um, in the um, proposals. Uh, so can you speak a little bit more about the evalu evaluation plan? Are there specific ways to measure outcomes in reporting? So basically what we're looking for in an evaluation plan as you we, we we keep it really very straightforward and give it to you because this is your project. You're going to tell us how, what, and how and when you are going to uh, evaluate, you, how you are going to evaluate your project. And we'll, based on that feedback, uh, that proposition, the plan you're gonna give us, will probably look at the, uh, depending on the project idea and how that plan will be able to uh, make a decision based that uh, if that plan is feasible or not. So, but it's on you to tell us what, how, and when you're doing, uh, we are going to evaluate uh, your pro your project. And on top of that is a reporting requirement, right? So as Sharon said earlier, the submission of an interim report, and then a much more robust final report, where we'll be asking you to describe the outcomes and outputs uh, of your projects. So if I want to add something also in the application question, I think it's very important for you to go and click on that PDF application form before you start drafting your application. And in that application, not only people miss, they give us an evaluation plan, but there is a trick. What would you do after? So the, app, the question is usually, uh, tell us your, your uh, what is your, the evaluation plan for this project and what will you do once the evaluation is completed? So if you just give us an evaluation plan and you don't you give us the next step and somebody else did uh, pay attention to that detail, that's give, put you in a disadvantage. So it's always important also, if it is a pilot project, you need it to expand it, let us know. If this is wrap up creating the final report, let us know, you know, and uh, sharing it with the report, that evaluation plan with your stakeholder, let us know so that we know uh your project is not going to end with even though the funding is end uh, that's one time funding but we know that at least uh, we help you carry something uh over to next steps okay. uh can an organization that received funding last year still be eligible to send in a proposal for this round if their project um doesn't end until next year in April 2024? Yes, you can apply, but I would encourage you to finalize that project you're in. If that project is not finalized, it's okay that a lot of these ongoing projects we funded are requesting because most of them from previous 
iteration of NARF supposed to end December 2023, but some of them, given uh, some circumstances, are asking for uh, extension. We have extended. So if your project is, is still going on and the, an, uh, uh, an extension, you won't be able to come back for that same project because it's still on. But if you wrap up that project and you want to apply for a different project, yes, you can apply. Okay. Can you clarify the difference between the projects versus events and youth initiatives funding streams? What sort of projects would fit within each funding stream? I'll leave that to Sharon. Okay. So the biggest difference I think is events and youth are more short term. So the deadline for events and youth projects for both, we have two rounds. Um, one deadline for project activities is March 31st, 2024, um, but all activities must be completed by July 2024. While project stream, um, the deadline or the end date for all your project activities is March 2025, um, I believe. So the difference is in short-term, long-term of the project, um, all as well as the funding amounts available for them. Thank you. It says that one of the eligibility criteria that's new for this round is for organizations with a budget more than $250,000 to have audited financial statements. It's very unusual for small organizations to have audited statements because auditing is so expensive. Is that a criteria CRF would consider changing so that smaller organizations can apply if statements are prepared by an accountant? Uh, I don't think audited financial or unaudited financials depend on the size of the organization. It's mostly the, attached to the revenue of the organization. So the key is, is here, if you're making 250, and this is a recommendation from the CRA. So if your organization and your revenue is 250,000 or above, we need audited financial. But if your revenue is less than that, you don't need to be audited. You can submit it the, done by your uh, internal uh, uh, accounting or uh, in-house. So that's that's the thing. It's not attached to the size of the organization, but rather the revenue. Okay. Is this a multi-year fund and do we apply yearly? or can we submit a multi-year application? As mentioned during the presentation, I think there is a start and an end day. So that sums it all. We, unfortunately, we have uh, one um, uh, one allocation to, as we said, we have two webs though. So, but different projects. So it's one project at a time and we, specific start and end date and also once this one as sharon mentioned or sharon mentioned earlier we'll have another wave of funding for different uh, projects but we don't we not at a multi-year uh, year, uh, funding yet okay um if i am an independent researcher in a publicly funded university doing research and work directly relevant to this funding, am I eligible to apply? So as I think it was very clear that individuals are not eligible to apply. However, if that or that university is open to applying uh, to implement your research, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's important you have that conversation with uh, your leadership at your university saying that if they're interested in uh, um, applying for funding uh, because we do not assess individual, we assess organization. So that's why, as you can see, we're asking uh, a board, uh, a board, how many, uh, the list of your board members of the organization, we're asking for uh, financial statesmen, we're asking for, uh, we go to website, so to check uh, who's in the team leading this project, but uh, we do not, unfortunately, individual project will not be eligible, so. 
Okay. Um, when we explain costs, do you need quotes for services you would be purchasing? Uh, do we have to include quotes? And if so, is uh, one quote enough or do you need multiple quotes? No, we're not requiring, uh, we do not require quotes at this uh, stage, uh, but it would be nice to keep them. And once you get funding, uh, what we do not at this stage, but once you get uh, the funding, I think it would be uh, important to keep the, your receipt or your quotes, uh, depending what you put the by, uh, you what you put on your budget item, so that in in the final reporting, uh, I think you will have to uh, we may ask for the receipts or receipt or quotes. So, but at this stage, we do not require quotes. Thank you. Let me Are just, we able to? Uh, oh, yeah, just go ahead. Add, so that I just want to flag that as that being a, a slightly unusual circumstance where we would ask for that level of financial reporting at with the final report. Uh, that is not kind of our standard practice to ask organizations to submit rece receipts or quotes. But again, as Ibrahim has said, there may be circumstances where we would do that, um, but is not typically the case. Are we able to submit an application to the project stream for the January 8th deadline and then submit to the events and youth initiatives later in 2024? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, are First Nation band councils required to submit annual financial statements for the last two years to apply for funding? Um, this could be an overwhelming undertaking as First Nation Band Councils are responsible for administering healthcare, education, housing, and other programs and services. I would say that we would require some kind of financial reporting uh, at the very least. And so that, that might be a question that we might want to ask or answer with the organization specifically. Uh, so if they have a question about that kind of eligibility, they can reach out to us at the grants inbox and we can discuss it. But at the very least, uh, if it's not an audited statement, we would require some kind of annual financial reporting for sure. Um, for organizations uh, receiving CS Mari or ARAP already, uh, can they, um, does it have to be an extension of the existing project with CS Mari or ARAP? Um, or can they apply separately um, from that? So as we, as mentioned, I think earlier, it has to be an, ex, an extension, meaning that usually an extension, meaning that you have received the funding uh, and you want to, you have completed that project and you want to replicate it or extend it to another community, that's eligible. But uh, what we wouldn't want to be doing, and we're going to be transparent, we will be collaborating with uh, uh, Heritage Canada, making sure that we do not fund the same project twice, meaning that you might, you won't be getting an approval from CRC, uh, from Heritage Canada and us for the same project. So we are working collaborative to, to avoid that. And we do not want you to waste your time investing doing that. So that's why we put it on the guideline. So now if you have a funding uh, some your project is in review and you haven't uh, heard anything about it, you can apply to us, but we're going to do that check. Just to let you know, we're going to do that check. So in any case, we're going to do, to do our best to, uh, to not duplicate funding for, uh, that's what we're aiming for. But if you are wrapping a project and you think it was a super successful in an area, but you want to replicate it or you want to add some more uh, deliverable to make it much more impactful, yes, you can apply. Okay. Rosalind, I just I just want to take a pause for one minute. We've got about five minutes left, but I'm just seeing a comment in the Q&A just asking us to slow down a little bit. So as presenters, we'll, we'll slow it down a little bit as we're offering our, our responses and, and apologies for that. So go ahead, Rosalind. Okay. And I just want to clarify that the CSMAR and ARAP, um, even if they are funded already by CSMAR and ARAP, they can still apply uh, for a separate initiative from that, right? Okay. Absolutely. I think, I think our 
qualification there is that we don't want to be uh, duplicating efforts, right, between heritage and us. And so we want to make sure that they're, they're um, you know, we're not funding the same project, essentially. Okay. Um, I have a question about would honoraria for elders be considered or is this still excluded? Yes, uh, honorarium for elders, as long it is aligned with your project deliverable is and uh, uh, is eligible. So what we do, we're gonna look at your project deliverable and we are always gonna look, uh, look at what are the uh, what are the uh, the budget items and trying to see there is if there is a connection to those, but just a separate honorarium without no connection to the project won't be won't be. I mean, you can uh, put it there, but we won't be able to uh, provide funding for those standalone uh, honorarium. Okay. Um. Do you? accept only one proposal from each organization, or do you approve only one proposal despite receiving multiple proposals from an organization? It's one at this time, hopefully it was gonna change given the other some factors, we are uh, uh, focusing on one application per, per organization. Okay. Uh, that said, so organizations can apply for events and youth, twice they can apply for projects once but again i would urge folks to to consider that against our conversation earlier about us being able to only fund a, a fraction of the projects that were that you know that we receive applications for so use your time wisely and strategically for sure um, and as is always the case we're looking to spread the wealth across organizations and across communities Um, do projects need to be new or can they be ongoing? Yes, new projects are eligible. Ongoing meaning, uh, I mean, if again, if it is a project that's finished and you need it to be replicated or to be uh, extended to a different community or a new aspect to it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it can be uh, eligible but a project that is ongoing, usually ongoing in meaning operational. That's what you do on your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Let's, let's say that you're providing support to newcomers and you come up with a project that's the same thing. And it, that's to us, that's operational. But if you targeting a specific, you have specific ideas for newcomers and uh, that's focused on, of course, aligned with the objective, that's a different thing. But if you're supporting newcomers in uh, uh, how they integrate into new life in Canada, how they do, uh, how they sustain themselves to be successful, that's for us, that's ongoing and it won't be eligible. How many letters of support can we include? I mean, we don't, we don't give, uh, numbers of letters of support, but it would be good because especially if you partnering with organization and those key partner, I think it will be very helpful for you to provide the letter of support from them. So we know that they really, they're there to support, to work with you uh, in this project. But uh, it's again, what I wanted to mention, it's optional and uh, it won't negate the fact, we won't be focusing, oh, you don't have letter of support, you're out. But again, it's a competitive process. So if you have to co uh, to compare to Apple, we're gonna look at the Apple that have more juiciness. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, if there is a partnership, do you have recommendations on who should be the lead applicant? We do not really recommend who should be the lead, but the lead organization should be an eligible organization to apply for funding. But we're not going to say, and the lead organization should be the one who will be signing the contract, will be responsible for managing the funding, uh, will be su uh, submitting the final report, will be managing the financials and uh, everything. 
So that's the lead, but we won't be telling who should be the lead as long as they're eligible and they sign the agreement, they are making sure that the project is delivered according to the agreement and on time. That's the, that's the most important thing. Okay. Um, do we have go to pause? Sorry. Do we want to take maybe one more question before we close off? We can do one more. And the last question okay. is what support do regional coordinators offer Rosalind? Um, yeah, so for regional coordinators, we are in the programs and outreach department. Um, certainly if you know you're having issues getting your questions answered, we can try to um, help and assist with some of that uh, during the application process. Um, but a lot of our role is actually in the monitoring of uh, the the um, the uh, the ones that do get approved. Um, so that is really mostly our role. We cannot advise on your proposals, um, but we can certainly assist in answering the questions that you have. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your questions. And thanks Rosalind for facilitating. Um, the recording for this webinar will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel over the next day or two. And the presentation deck will also be sent to all attendees. Um, we couldn't get to everyone's questions today, but for any further questions can be submitted to the CRF grants email. Um, and just to quickly, as a quick reminder, any questions submitted between December 22nd and January 1st will be answered as soon as possible after the holidays, starting January 2nd. Um, thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.